Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Ask Troy Live. My name is Bill. And I'm Anthony. And we work on the Chainsaw team at Troy Built. We're here to answer questions and go over the safe usage of the chainsaw tools. We're going to talk about how to maintain them to get the best possible uh, use from them um, and how to solve common issues that we hear, things like starting issues, um, how to store the saw safely, gear that you should use while you use the machines, um, and uh, be sure to drop any questions you have as we're going along into the chat window, and the Troy Built team will be answering those as we go. Today we're both wearing uh, safety gloves, which we strongly advise you use when you're maintaining your saw, and we're also using eye protections. Um, this is a really a good requirement for uh, doing maintenance on the saw. The saw chain is very sharp. Um, doesn't matter if it's brand new or has been used. Um, you run the risk of cutting yourself without gloves on. Um, and there are all sorts of residues once the machine has been used, uh, oil, fuel, um, things that could get in your eyes that um, definitely are not safe and would be uncomfortable. So. Uh, be sure to get that eye protection on. Now, when you actually use a chainsaw, you're out in the field using it, we do advise that you use some additional safety gear. So uh, one is a full helmet um, that has an additional face guard on it for debris, um, ear protection, of course, um, and then chainsaw chaps, which allow you to operate the machine safely. These go on your legs, and it keeps you safe in the event that the chainsaw blade ac accidentally comes into contact with your leg. Um, it will stop the saw immediately and it will protect you from a nasty injury. Other things that you should have on hand um, are extra rags. Uh, this will be for cleaning up fuel spills, um, uh, oil that might be on the saw, etc. And your scringe tool. So your scringe tool comes with the machine it's a flathead screwdriver on one end, and it has two different size uh, bolt sprockets on the other for adjusting everything on the saw. So if you have lost your scringe tool, you can do the same job with uh, tools that you probably have in your toolbox. Um, however, we advise that you just carry that uh, scringe tool with you when you have your chainsaw, because it'll allow you to make adjustments that you'll need to do on the fly. Um, so we've talked about the things that you'll, that you'll need in order to maintain and run the saw. Um, but let's talk about uh, fuel. Uh, so when we are fueling these engines, actually, you know what? Let's take a couple of these saws away so we have a little bit more room to work. I agree. So we're going to leave the 18-inch the saw up here and the 20-inch saw. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what we should do when we either take this out of the box or we're starting it up for the first time. Uh, it's maybe been sitting in our garage or shed, but we need to use our chainsaw, all right? So um, the first things we should talk about are the fuel and the bar oil, okay? So fuel, if you've followed along with other Ask Troy Live events, um, you'll know that we are always talking about pre-engineered fuels. Um, and so these are pre-mixed fuels. This is one brand that's out there, True Fuel. Um, you'll see that it says what the oil to uh, fuel ratio is. It's 40 to 1, which is the same as all Troy built chainsaws. Um, and this just refers to the oil to the gas mixture itself. Um, if you don't use an engineered fuel, you can mix it yourself. So you'll buy the um, 40 to 1 oil, which will be a, a smaller canister. You'll mix it with a gallon of gas that you have purchased from uh, a gas station. And you'll mix it yourself. Now, why do we always suggest this? <laughs> gotcha, I stumped you. Well, the reason we always suggest this is because, um, because when you're running this equipment, if you have ethanol in the gas, it can have a negative effect on the performance of the equipment in that ethanol, when it sits in a tank for several weeks or longer, it'll actually pull some water moisture from the air. Um, and the reason this is bad is because once that moisture is inside your gas can or inside the fuel tank, the machine can't burn that. It can't operate on it, and there's no way to safely pass that through. The result of that is it'll seem like your machine is very hard to start or it's not starting at all. Um, and so that's why we're always suggesting just to use a pre-engineered fuel. You can buy it at any outdoor equipment dealer. Um, or mass market um, that sells uh, Troy Built or really any other 
gasoline-powered brand. You'll also need bar and chain oil. So bar and chain oil comes from many different brands. Um, it's all the same depending on, uh, you know, being that it's for chainsaw usage. And this is entirely for lubricating the bar and chain itself. Has nothing to do with the fuel in the engine. It's not the fuel oil mix that you're looking for. So if you're looking for oil to mix with the fuel, do not use bar and chain oil. It's only for the bar and chain. And the chainsaws each have two ports, one for fuel, one for oil. They're a little bit different depending on the, where, the, the size of model you have. The 20 inch here has the oil up front and the fuel in back, whereas the 14, 16, and 18 inch have them both on the side panel there. You'll be sure to fill those up uh, to their maximum level before starting or using the saw. Uh, cinch down the, uh, the covers on those so you're ready to go. The other important thing to do that's often overlooked is the air filter. So on both of the models we have, in fact, all four of these models, the 14, the 16, the 18, and the 20, they all have a removable cover on the top that requires only hand pressure to turn. And inside is an air filter. Anthony, you wanna grab that air filter right there? So let's get a camera zoom in on this. So the air filter itself is a very fine mesh. It looks a little bit different than air filters in other two cycle engines. Um, and it's uh, sort of a three dimensional box design. And you can see, um, and you'll see on your own unit, that the mesh is on both sides. And it can be opened up with your hands, doesn't require any tools to do that. And the reason you would open it up is to pour water on the inside to release any debris that's on the outside of your air filter. Having a clean air filter is essential when it comes to chainsaw operation. And the reason for that is that chainsaws operate at full, um, uh, they, they operate at the full throttle when people are cutting the wood. So it requires very clean fuel to enter into the engine and a lot of clean air. So having the, the big air filter here is a, a benefit to the Troy built machine and keeping it clean is something you should do every time you're operating the saw to verify that it's not caked on with dirt, doesn't have uh, too much dust or debris on it. It's very easy to clean, you need no tools. Um, and you really only need to ever replace this item if it has a tear or hole in that mesh. For the sake of time, we're just not going to put it on because the, the bolt takes a while to undo with your bare hands. Uh, but we have it in both of our machines now. Um, and the other steps are, that are involved in chainsaws to start them are really about the settings of the machine. Um, the chain brake, which is right up in this area here, um, when it's engaged, you'll hear a loud click and it's stiff, it's, it's unmovable. To the normal operation of the saw is pulled back and it's very flexible. You can see it has a lot of give in both directions. The chain brake is a safety feature that allows for if a kickback were to happen, this chain brake engages and it stops the saw blade immediately. Um, so this helps you if you come into some contact with something that pulls the saw away from your hands. But to start the saw, you need to have this pulled back. You need to have it in this position here. The other important things with the chainsaw is that there's an on-off switch to them. The on-off switch, the, the zero or O mark, when it's pressed in, the chainsaw is off. And so if I try to start this with the switch in the off position, we will find that it just won't start. You'll be pulling on the cord forever, and you may think this product is uh, doomed, it's not working, I have a defective unit. Um, but it is in fact a working unit. You really need to make sure that the on switch is flipped before you start the unit. The reason it has an on off switch is so when you're using it, you have a kill switch basically. You can turn it off while you're setting it down on the ground and it'll shut all the functions of the saw off uh, in one go. Now the other important uh, elements of starting are of course the fuel bulb right here which helps prime the in engine. You'll be pressing this 10 times. You'll be filling that with fuel and uh, as we were looking at some saws uh, earlier today, you actually will see some air in there. It'll look like there's air bubbles forming. That's fine. You just want this to be, look like it's mostly full of gas. Once you have it full of gas, the fuel has been circulated through the engine. You'll pull out the, the choke mechanism um, and it'll, it'll pull out slightly. This will allow lots of air into the engine during your starting. 
you need to have this on the ground, all right? Chainsaws must be started on the ground for safety reasons. And that is, you'll put your foot right here on the saw, uh, you'll put your hand around the ha wraparound handle, gripping it with all fingers, and then you'll start pulling the recoil handle. You'll pull this five times, and the saw is not gonna start, so don't be alarmed by that. You don't need to pull hard either, okay? Your chainsaw has a spring inside that that allows a very simple slow pull. You'll pull it the entire length of the cord, um, and you'll release it each time. So just five pulls. You'll then push the choke back in, pull it three to four times, and it should fire up. Now, Anthony and I have worked around outdoor power equipment for some time, and one of the big misconceptions is that if it's not starting, that you simply either need to pull harder or faster. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you feel like your arm is getting to that point where it's about to fall off and you're thinking, geez, this product is so hard I cannot start it, well, you're actually doing that a little bit incorrectly, okay? You can do it without a whole lot of effort, let the mechanism inside the unit do its job, um, and it will fire up for most people just fine. Now, if you find that it's not firing up, you simply reset everything and start from the, the, the beginning over again. The flip side on this is if it's a hot restart. So hot restarts mean that I have uh, been cutting wood and I'm setting the saw down on the ground to either adjust something, get ready for my next cut. Um, I turn the saw off so it's not running. Uh, and then when I need to restart it again, again, putting it on the ground, putting your boot into uh, the handle here, and you simply need to pull start. Okay, if you need, you can activate the choke and pull start again, but for most people, it'll fire up within two to three pulls. You don't what have if to it do the fire pull. up at that time. You know, for mo when if it doesn't still doesn't fire up, start over from the beginning. And when I say start over from the beginning, I mean do the checks that need to be done. Check the air filter, check your fuel. Okay, if you, ha if, if you had fuel in the tank and it was in the tank for the last three months, and then you skip that step because you thought, well, I already have fuel in there, I don't need to do that. Unfortunately, that may be the root cause of why it's not starting. So uh, remove the fuel, start over from scratch, do all the steps over again, and we would expect that the unit will fire right up. That's how we start the saw. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to other common things that happen with a chainsaw, one of the really big ones is the chain tension. Um, this is something that has to be adjusted every time you use the saw, both before you start using it, during the use of the saw, and technically at the end of the use of the saw. So let's go over that real quick so that people get a better understanding of how to care for this machine. Uh, doing chainsaw maintenance and work does require more steps than other outdoor power equipment. The, the, the machine is a little bit more complex, the way it works has a lot of friction points. So we really need to make sure that every time we use it, we follow the same steps. That will give us the longest life possible out of this saw. It'll make the 100th cut as easy as the first cut. And so we really wanna make sure that we are um, performing these maintenance steps. Anthony, let's take a look at the chain tension itself. So um, in order to check the chain, so this one, let's see if we get a good camera on it, angle on it. So when Anthony pulls the chain down, you'll see that we can see the drive links exposed. The drive links are what the machine uses to power the chain. The drive links are always in the chainsaw bar in a track that goes through. Um, and to check the tension on this, we literally just grab the chain and we pull straight down. And what we see here is that there is room between, go ahead and pull it down again, Anthony. There's room between the top of the drive link and the bar. There's literally light and air passing through there. This chain is tensioned too loose. And by looking at it when it's not being pulled down, right, it looks like it's perfectly fine. Uh, and this is why we have to do this check, okay? And so if we don't have the chainsaw tensioned properly, uh, we run the risk of the chainsaw, uh, I'm sorry, the chain coming off during operation, which could cause an injury, and we don't want that. If the chainsaw tension is too tight, it will also uh, kind of look like when you start it up, it'll feel like the chain isn't responding. You're, throw, you're hitting the accelerator, the, the um, throttle, and it's 
either making noise or it's just not moving as fast as it should be. That's a cause of over-tensioning. So to adjust the tension on the machine, we use our scrunch, okay? And you see the two bolts on the side. And what Anthony's gonna do is he's gonna loosen these. He's not taking them off, he's just loosening them. And when you loosen these bolts, this allows you to adjust the chainsaw tension. So he's, have you done both bolts over there, Anthony? Yes, sir. Okay, and so he's putting the flat head into the screw, which is our chain tensioner. When you do it clockwise, it tightens it, counterclockwise loosens it. So um, do, do we tighten or loosen? Tighten. We tightened, okay. So before you reattach, I'm sorry, before you uh, take the bolts and really ratchet them down, we want to do the test again. Now, as long as those drive links are still engaged with the, the chainsaw bar, we're good. You wanna, but you do wanna see about three quarters of that drive link come out. So you can see he's pulling down on it and the uh, drive links are being exposed, but the tips of those drive links are staying inside the chainsaw bar. That's how we know we've tensioned it correctly. If he's pulling down and he can't, and we're not even seeing those, those drive links, then it's too tight. Now, you remember I told you that you have to adjust this before you use the saw and during the use of the saw. When you use a chainsaw from its completely cold start, the heat and friction that the chain is subjected to will make the metal in the chain relax. So it'll actually start appearing to get loose while you're using the chainsaw. And so within about 15 minutes of use, you need to shut your saw off and do the exact same test that we just did. Pull the chain down, remember, chainsaw's off. Pull the chain straight down, see how much of that drive link is exposed, and either tighten or loosen the tension and retighten the bolts, and then you're good to go again. Now, you don't have to do this every 15 minutes. It's really the first 15 minutes where this comes as a concern. However, as the chainsaw is being used, the temperature of the chain will change. And so it's always good to stop every once in a while, check your tension and adjust it. So it's a very common thing to do. Now, when the chainsaw is done for the day, when you're absolutely done, your chain's gonna be uh, uh, very hot, right? And so you wanna make sure that as it cools down, that it has enough room to tighten on the saw. So you'll actually, once again, go in there and release some tension so that as that chainsaw cools, it doesn't become so tight on the bar um, that it freezes the chainsaw up over time. Another common issue that we have is, a, is related to the oil. Now, your, when I say the oil, I mean the bar and chain oil. The uh, bar and chain oil is only for lubricating the chain and the bar during operation. Okay, they must stay lubricated or the saw will start basically melting the metal. We don't want that. The oil though is on every Choi built chainsaw, the oil is in the form of an adjustable automatic oiler. So if you used to own a chainsaw 20 years ago, you might remember that there was a button on the side and you press that button every time you needed oil. Well, newer chainsaws do this for you automatically. They produce a very steady, consistent flow of oil that comes out of the chainsaw directly onto the bar and chain itself and keeps it lubricated while in operation. This pump only works while the saw is moving, okay? It doesn't work if the saw is turned off, um, but it is adjustable. And so when we produce this at our factory, we actually open that adjustability to its maximum setting because we're not sure what you're cutting through. We're not sure the size of log, the time that you're cutting, how much uh, um, energy and effort you're specific cutting job requires. Since we don't know that, we adjust that automatic oiler to its maximum. And if you don't like that, if it, you find that this thing is emitting too much oil, or when you store it in the garage, it's creating a big oil pool underneath it from all the oil dripping off the chain and the bar, um, the way to adjust that is actually on the bottom of the machine. So we're gonna have Anthony turn over his 18 inch Troy built model and we're gonna point to it. So the adjustable oiler, um, when you can find it in the instruction manual, there's uh, some printing on the bottom here. But in this case, the way you find it is there's a little uh, sort of carve out in the housing of the chainsaw. And you can see it uh, right by Anthony's finger, he's pointing right at it. 
Um, and inside this area, your, your screwdriver part of your scrunch will fit. And uh, with some keen eyes, you'll find the screw inside. It's a black screw, so it doesn't come across real well uh, for this filming that we're doing right now. But you simply turn that to the right or to the left. You turn it to the right, it's gonna reduce the amount of oil. It won't shut it off entirely. And the reason for that is you have to have oil in order to operate a chainsaw safely and effectively. So again, if you find the chainsaw is oiling too much, by all means adjust it. It's one of the key features of a Troy built chainsaw. Just a quick reminder, don't forget to put your questions into the chat window. Uh, the Troy built team will be answering them as we go. Hopefully we're answering some of your questions on air right now, uh, but don't hold back. Whatever you need, uh, we're here to help you. All right, so we've talked about starting, we've talked about tension, and we've talked about how to adjust the oil on the machine. Another important thing we really need to talk about is the chain itself and how to sharpen this chain and how to, how to and when to replace the chain and the bar. Um, if you've been to uh, retailers and looked at chainsaw items, you'll see that they often carry chainsaw bars and chainsaw chains. The reason for that is that the chains do dole over time. In fact, every time you cut with them, they're doling ever so slightly. Now, a Troy built, all Troy built models have a low kickback bar and chain. And what this means is that the chain has certain features on it that keep it, uh, use, keep it usable in a safe condition so that any kickbacks that might occur with the chainsaw are reduced. They're not eliminated, uh, so you still have to operate this machine safely, uh, but it reduces the instance of kickbacks. Um, and so sharpening the chainsaw chain is about knowing how to do it and when to stop doing it and replace the chain outright. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at how to sharpen real quickly. So what Anthony's got in his hand uh, is a chainsaw sharpening tool. And each one of the cutting uh, links of the chain uh, has a sharp point to it, is sort of uh, at an angle as you'll see. Um, and then they're spaced out, probably about every inch and a half is a cutting blade. Right next to the cutting blade is what's called a depth gauge. And so it's a small little post that's sticking straight up right before the cutting edge. Sharpening a chainsaw is not necessarily difficult if you have the right tools. You simply put the file in, match the angle. Uh, in this case, uh, you'll, there's lines on here which you'll match up. And you simply push the file through um, each of the chain links. You'll do all of one side first, then you'll do all the opposing side because the angles change. The key though is that you also remove some of the metal on the depth gauge. So you'll need another file to do a couple strokes on the depth gauge to take it down. And this allows the, the kerfs, which are the little chunks of wood, sawdust I think is what most people would call that. The sawdust, it allows you to cut meaningful pieces out of the wood. If you find that as you're cutting, it looks like dust coming out the back uh, or very fine sawdust that's uh, almost like paper thin, well, generally what that means is that your depth gauge is too shallow. It's not, you didn't grind it down. Maybe you sharpened the links very well, but you did not take a little bit off that depth gauge. Because every time we sharpen the saw, it's removing a little bit of the metal. Now, one more thing for our cameraman to zoom in on is the detail of this chain, which is, like I mentioned, is a low kickback chain. So about where I'm pointing right now, um, the, it's a, uh, a cutting blade that's on my side of the chainsaw. And on your side, the camera angle is a black fin. It almost looks like a shark's fin right there. When you start sharpening the chain and digging into that black fin, you're starting to remove that safety feature for the low kickback chain. And that's really where, for a residential saw, that's sort of the warning that you have that you probably need to replace this chain to one, retain the safety features of it, and to two, obviously, get yourself a very sharp chain. So let's talk about, if we're in that, that realm, what we should do. Anthony, what do you use chainsaws for in your personal life? Uh, personally, I just use it to cut down small tree branches every now and then, probably only a few times a year. Okay. So, and I use my chainsaw if I go camping or hunting, and generally to collect firewood at the end of the year. 
And so as a result of that, our chain needs may be a little bit different. Depending on how much you're using the saw, right? I said you should figure that there'll be a little bit of doling every time you use it. If you're just using it to cut branches, to do pruning once in a while as your growth gets a little bit unmanageable and you're cleaning it up, well, you're really not using the saw that often. That chain's gonna stay sharp for a long period of time. For my purpose where I'm cutting firewood, I'm gonna dole it more quickly because it's a full day of cutting uh, you know, wood that's either fallen on the, the forest ground or dead trees that I'm felling. Um, and so as a result of that, um, you, I may change my chain eh, once a year. Anthony may need to change his chain once every two years. The rule of thumb for most people that use a chainsaw somewhat frequently is to change that chain once a year. And as far as the bar, and we'll talk about this as we remove the bar, for many people, you, remove, you change the bar every two chains. So for me, it might be every two years I, I change the bar, but we'll take a look at the bar to make sure that it's safe to put back on uh, when we remove it here in a moment. So let's talk about how to remove that. Anthony, can I have you spin that saw around for the camera? Okay, so changing a chainsaw chain and bar follows some of the steps that we did before. So first up, we're going to release the tension on the chain. So Anthony is gonna loosen those two bolts, doesn't need to take them off. So we're just loosening them, and he's going to now release the tension on the chain. And you'll see the chain sort of above his forearm there, you'll see it start slackening um, as he releases this down. So you'll see the chainsaw bar dip a little bit, And so now when he's playing with the chain, you see there's a lot of slack in that chain. At this point, he just removes both bolts. So you wanna, re you wanna get that tension off the chain before you do this step, uh, because it'll make assembling it all back together again that much easier. Okay, so Anthony's just removed both of those bolts. Still working on the second one. All right. Now, we were, we were practicing this a moment ago and we're both wearing these gloves, which are actually kind of form-fitting gloves. Um, and it may look like we're fumbling around with the bolts, but that's really just a reaction of having the gloves. This is a very tempting place to say, you know what, I'll take the gloves off, I'll just use my bare hands, I have better dexterity. The problem with that is, is that we're still dealing with a sharp chainsaw. So really keep the gloves on, it's no joke, the cuts are not nice. Um, and it's better to take a little bit more time fumbling around with it than going fast and risking uh, injury. So he's removed the two bolts. Now he's going to uh, gently wobble the unit and get the, uh, the chain brake cover off. And you see that this comes with the chain brake coming off. So it's all one piece that comes off together. And by simply pushing it on the bar and releasing it, uh, you can release the chain as well. Um, and it allows you to just take the chain right off. At this point, you would, uh, if you have a new chain, you'll simply replace the chain and put it on. But before we do that, let's point out a couple things on the bar real quick for everyone to see. So one of the more confusing parts of going shopping for a new chain is that you'll see it's asking a lot of very sort of oddball questions that you may not have seen before. So what we do at Troy Belt is we actually print on the bar itself what the part numbers are for this bar and this chain, which will be different on each saw. Um, so Anthony's pointing to that right now. You'll see those two part numbers. Now, this also exists on the saw. So you'll see there's a label on every saw that gives you both the bar part number and the chain part number. This will allow you to buy a Troy built replacement bar and chain. Now, in the event that you can't find a Troy built bar and chain or your local dealer, you need the saw right this moment, you can't buy it online and you need to buy uh, a chain from another manufacturer, you'll also see on the bar, and if you wanna to point to this, it looks like a little bit of a code. It has a number, it has the letters DL, and then it has a measurement. DL stands for drive links. That's the amount of drive links that the chain has in order to be turned by the sprocket. So in this case, it's a 62 drive link chain that's 3 8 inch. That piece of information right there allows you to buy a chainsaw chain if you don't know the part number. 
Um, so always look at your bar and your replacement bar that you put in should have that information on it as well. So if you find a chainsaw bar that doesn't have any of that information, I'd say keep looking until you find either a Troy built bar or something else that does because at some point you're gonna to need to replace this in the future. And like most of us, we don't think about chainsaw chains on a daily basis. When we need them, we need them. And when we replace them, we replace them. So in this case, uh, we would have a new 18 inch uh, chain. Let's take a look over here. So at the very tip, the very tip of the chainsaw bar is an image and it shows you the direction that the chain's turning and it gives you a diagram of both what a drive link looks like in this position and a cutting blade. So match that up and then you know that you have the right configuration on your chain. So you can start then by looping it around uh, the sprocket here and the clutch drum. And then you simply start wrapping the chain around the chainsaw bar, putting those drive links into the groove. And you'll see Anthony just kind of pulls that bar straight out and that gives him some more tension. What we're trying to do is get it to basically look like the tension that it was when we removed it. Um, looks like it came off a little bit. And you'll see there's a, there's a little nuance to this, right? It takes a few times to get it lined up correctly, but you don't need to make sure that it's all in the channel. It's fine if a little bit is hanging outside and we'll show you here this in a, in a second. But this allows Anthony to line up the screws, the bolts, um, and get this back on track. Now, you might be saying, well, what are the, the reasons I would replace a chainsaw bar? Now, if you start seeing the logo getting rubbed off the bar, generally that means there's either a slight bend in the bar um, or it's not getting enough oil. Um, it's starting to burn the, the bar, which changes the, the functionality of it. You could also find metal burrs along the leading edge that is right between the chain and the, uh, the bar itself. So if you see any deformities or you feel any deformities with your hands, it's time to change that chainsaw bar. They won't last forever, so it's, uh, it's a very common replacement item. So you'll see Anthony made sure the chain could rotate. Now he's putting the bolts back on and you see the tension on the chain is very loose and that's completely acceptable. So he's not gonna tighten it down entirely until he gets the bolts on. He'll put both of them on, and then before he fully tightens this, he's gonna use that chainsaw adjustment in order to get the chain tightened. And as we get a little bit tighter, we're gonna move that chainsaw chain along the bar, and if it has derailed at all, it's gonna come back on. Hold so go nice. ahead and... Thank you. So as you see, he's turning it now. You don't have to do that while you're tensioning it, but this allows you to just make sure that it's all seated on the bar itself. And by doing that, it will automatically seat if, if there were any derailed parts. Now, now he's checking the chain tension, right? So you wanna make sure that you can see about three quarters of the drive link coming out. You don't wanna be able to see completely over the drive link. And once you have that tension, then you go ahead and hand tighten those bolts and you are back in business with your chainsaw. You have a fresh chain, you have a fresh bar, and you're gonna have a great cutting experience as a result. Being good at chain tensioning is something that you should just plan on training yourself. You need to be good at this because it's a common um, adjustment that needs to be made every single time you use your chainsaw. So learn how to use that, get good at it. You don't need to take it to a repair shop to do this fix. Um, and you will find that by taking care of the starting system, by taking care of the chain and the bar, that your saw has a very long lifespan ahead of it, and it will stay in your collection of outdoor power equipment and be a valuable contributor uh, for years and years as a result. We talked about how to change the bar, and, and um, you know, generally from a safe operation standpoint, we always wanna make sure that we are maintaining the saw every single time. One question we often get is like, what's the right chainsaw for me, for you? Now we talked about this briefly, so you take yours out to do limbing and so on, mm -hmm. but what are, the, what are the limitations of using this for uh, pruning trees? I can't cut down a tree trunk. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't cut down a tree well, trunk. Well, right. Some of our yes. users can. Um, but another really important feature is, is sizing up the cuts that you're gonna do, okay? So if you find yourself needing to cut something high up, 
especially in your case where you're limbing uh, trees, you're doing pruning work. If you're lifting that chainsaw above your shoulders, you really need to switch to a pole saw uh, to do your work. Chainsaws are meant for you standing on the ground doing the work. So if it's ground level from my shoulders all the way down to the ground, that's where you're looking at a traditional chainsaw like we have here. Anything higher than that, it's a pole saw. Um, now, as far as which size to pick, it all depends on what you're cutting. So where I live, uh, the forests are mainly ponderosa pine. Uh, other parts of, uh, uh, of the nation have uh, oak or maple, right? And these trees grow at different sizes. So knowing what you're gonna use the saw for and how you're generally gonna use it is gonna dictate what size of saw you need to buy. Common misperception is that if you buy a bigger 20 inch saw, it's going to somehow cut the wood better, faster, uh, whatever adjective you'd like to put in there. And that's not really the case. The 18 inch saw does have a, I'm sorry, the 20 inch saw does have a higher displacement engine. It does have a longer chain, but the engine is simply driving the chain. So no matter what size Troy built saw you buy, when you're actually cutting with them, they're all gonna feel like they cut wood the same. Uh, so if you need a smaller chainsaw because of the size wood, then buy the smaller chainsaw. If you're doing uh, general debris uh, clearing, say after hurricanes or tornadoes, maybe you want the biggest saw so that you have the most versatility. Um, but it's really up to you to decide what size chainsaw works best for you. But they're all designed so that you have the same experience no matter which one you choose. When might you want to call a pro for doing the job? Well, <clears throat> you know, many people buy chainsaws so they can do the work themselves. Uh, and I'm a big fan of that. Just like uh, if you're watching this video, I assume you've done it for that same reason. Now, there are certain limitations though that every consumer or resident should know about residential chainsaws. One, that we really don't want you cutting things above your shoulders because of the safety hazards of that. Uh, like I said, climbing in a ladder is not exactly uh, a safe use of a chainsaw or climbing up a tree. If I need to fell a tree and it's right next to my house or my neighbor's house, Right, if I do any of those steps wrong, I could cause thousands of dollars of damage. So um, if you find yourself needing to do something outside your skill level, you really need to call a pro. Um, if you call a tree service or an arborist, those guys are trained to climb up into trees and limb trees safely. Um, and so knowing your limitations and your safe limitations will both save you time and money for any possible damage that might occur. Um, for me, I go out and I cut firewood with it. If I fell a tree, it's not going to damage other things. It's not gonna damage personal property or the safety of others. Uh, and so I'm more comfortable with that. However, if you asked me to come to your house and do it, I would probably say no, because I don't want to be liable for a car or a house that gets damaged as a result of me not sizing up that, that task accurately. As far as getting the longest use out of your saw, Every Troy built saw comes with a two year warranty. Many times the kinds of calls that we get for warranty service are related to what we just talked about. Maybe the saw is not cutting well, but the, dull, the blade is dull. Maybe the saw is not starting well, but the fuel was left in it after last year's cut. Uh, and so there's water vapor inside the fuel tank or the engine. Um, and so all of these things cause a poor experience with a chainsaw, so that's why Understanding this part of it and setting yourself up when you start is important. Setting yourself up when you're done with the job is important so that the next time you use the saw, it's in tip top shape. Um, so is it a warranty issue? If it's not starting, remember all the steps. Remember the chain break. Remember the, f the air filter being clean. Remember the fuel being clean. Remember it being bar and chain oil, not, not engine oil. Uh, remember that the on-off switch is on or off. Um, so you, you always have to do these every single time you start the chainsaw. So create the, uh, the methodology in your head so you're doing step one, step two, step three, every single time, and you'll generally have good results with this saw. What would you say you should do if you are storing it for, you know, you only use it once every couple of months. So whenever you turn it off, what, what should you do with like the sure. fuel oil? Should you drain it all at that point? Should you 
check the air cleaning? Well, it's, it's, that's a good point. So there's a couple things that happen, uh, and we'll talk about them both. There's the fuel side, and then there's the bar and chain oil side. So with the fuel side, if I'm done with my cutting tasks, right, when I hunt or go uh, firewood collecting, it's always in the fall time where I live. So after that fall time period, I have very little use for a chainsaw, unless maybe something odd happens during the summer months, et cetera. So if I'm not gonna be using the saw for a month on end, I really need to drain that fuel. So you will uh, remove the, the, the cap and drain the fuel out, make sure it's empty. Um, and if you've mixed your own fuel or you've used a premixed fuel, um, generally the best case scenario is to add a little bit of premixed fuel, just a little bit, uh, start the engine up, and let it run through. So it'll run through the fuel that's within the fuel lines, it'll stall itself out, uh, and then you'll know that there's no fuel in the engine or the carburetor. And if there's no fuel in there, it doesn't attract water, which will make the saw harder to start the next time. Draining your bar and chain oil is also an important step. Now, I, I mentioned at the beginning that the bar and chain only gets oiled while the machine is on, while the machine is rotating, okay? Um, but that doesn't change the fact that when you turn this off, it's gonna be completely coated in lubricating oil. So it leads me into another common consumer complaint is that they buy their Troy Built Saw and when they're storing it in their garage, they think, wow, this thing is leaking oil all over the place, what's wrong with it? Um, and there's nothing wrong with your saw. It's not, there's no oil being used in the traditional sense to lubricate the engine. The oil that you're seeing is all oil, oil to lubricate the chain in the bar itself. And so when I turn this off and I take it home, it's going to be coated with oil. So much oil that any touch to it is gonna, you're gonna see oil everywhere. So when you put this in a shed, in your garage, in a chainsaw case, the next time you go to it, you're always gonna have oil spots underneath it. So it's just one important factor on when you buy a chainsaw is thinking about how you're gonna store the chainsaw because it doesn't matter what brand you're using, it doesn't matter um, what size of saw, they all require bar and chain oil. And this goes for battery powered saws as well. So you will always see oil just from the seepage and the dripping as it uh, slowly works its way out by gravity uh, onto whatever's underneath it. So storing your chainsaw bar in a scabbard, which comes with the unit, is important not just for safety of the saw, I think I brought the, I brought the wrong size over here, but not, important, uh, not only the importance of keeping the blade safe and out of people's hands, but collecting any oil that might be dripping from the bar itself. Doesn't change the fact that you'll have oil dripping from the bottom because it's gonna be coming out of the area where the chain wraps around the sprocket. Uh, so putting it on something, whether those are rags, cardboard, inside of a chainsaw case, will allow you to be able to clean up that oil as it happens and not create a permanent stain. And so really, you know, those are uh, the common questions. And once again, if we did not answer your question, put it into the chat window. Uh, our team will be answering these, including after we're off the air. Um, and we wanna make sure that you get the most out of your saw and that you, uh, when I say get the most, that you get years and years of usage out of this chainsaw. Um, so in closing, I just wanna say thank you once again for joining us for this Ask Troy live segment. Uh, thank you for purchasing a Troy built saw. Um, we hope you get uh, years of usage out of it and enjoy every moment of it. To learn about anything that we've talked about today um, or any other questions, please visit troybuilt.com and uh, we look forward to serving your product needs in the future.